Okay, well, we can kick things off uh, if that works for you, Zach. So my name is Dr. Alice Butler-Walk. I'm a lecturer in sociology here at Robert Gordon University uh, within the School of Applied Social Studies. Um, and I organize these schools community seminar series. So I'd like to welcome you uh, all and thank you for coming along this evening. Uh, we're really glad that you could make time to, to attend. So just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we begin. There'll be time at the end of Zach's talk for some questions. Um, and I ask that so that we're not doing the mute on mute kind of thing. If you've got any questions, can you pop them in the chat box and I'll feed them forward to our speaker. Secondly, this talk will be recorded and posted on the university's YouTube channel. Any questions that you post for Zach, I will read out anonymously um, so you can be assured of that. So on to today, we're really pleased to welcome Dr. Zach Taylor from KU Leuven. Um, Zach's research examines the relationships between housing, finance and climate change. They currently lead a European Union project which compares real estate climate risk governance in Florida, the Netherlands and Singapore. In addition to his academic work, Zach has experience working at nonprofit organizations on sustainable community development issues. Today, Zach will talk to us about their work on relationships between real estate, finance and climate risk using examples from their research on financing climate risk through insurance in Florida cities. So I'll hand over to you, Zach. Thanks, Alice. It's such a pleasure to be virtually connected um, and to see some familiar names in the um, attendance list, which is really cool. For those who don't know, um, Alice and I did our PhD together at the University of Leeds, so it's a bit of a, uh, I don't know, a reunion of sorts for us. So I want to just dive right in um, and begin with um, some anecdotes um, and take you back to how my research uh, on this topic started. Um, about five years ago, um, I was spending some time in Florida, uh, where I'm from, thinking about, on the one hand, the relationship between the fallout of the, the financial crisis, uh, which in many ways started as a housing and a real estate crisis in places like Florida, and on the other hand, about a looming crisis, about sea level rise, um, climate change, and its impacts on Florida. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Florida is a, a very low-lying, hurricane-prone coastal place uh, with a very fragile environment. And so at the time, I was grappling with a sort of contradictory set of scenes. So on the left and the right here, you see common scenes from the sort of post-crisis era, half-built um, homes and apartment towers, uh, suburban cul-de-sacs, um, you know, overgrown and incomplete with sometimes only one or two houses, uh, you know, against street after street after street overgrown. And at the same time, you started to see, you know, really profound development happening, particularly on the coast. Um, the cranes were coming back um, and they were coming back at full force. Uh, I remember uh, at the time doing an analysis of Miami's property market and between 2017 and 2018, there were over 90 high rises uh, completed in coastal areas or under construction, thousands of luxury units, a lot of capital rolling in from um, overseas, in Latin America in particular. And scenes like this, and particularly the one on the right, where you see uh, a sort of wall of buildings facing a wall of water, were really striking in the context of, at the time, uh, really nascent conversations around climate change adaptation in the state. Um, the governor of Florida at the time had infamously banned state officials from using the word climate change. There were very limited conversations at the state or even local levels about how to plan for it. And um, yeah, it was a very, very early time um, and a, a, an interesting time to be doing research. So I started to understand this contradiction, this context, you know, between, um, you know, really profound uh, crisis uh, what was the rejection of travel here? How was this problem being understood and managed? Uh, was it being managed? I started having conversations with uh, city planners, elected officials, real estate developers, and time and time again, I would get answers like this one, which comes from an insurance, or a, I'm sorry, a real estate and construction industry um, executive in Florida, uh, who said, 
So far, there hasn't been much discussion about the real players in this, the reinsurance industry. Right now, there doesn't seem to be any blowback on coastal areas. Eventually, you can have all the politics and all the plans that you want, but this private sector will eventually have to come to the table. If they come to the marketplace too quickly, they'll destroy value in the market, which is not the value of a re uh, resilience program. He wasn't alone here um, in pointing to the ways in which uh, insurance underpinned the uh, economy of Florida. And this diagram I've, I've illustrated here can kind of help you to understand how in the US context, not just in Florida, how central insurance is in the economy. So by way of uh, mortgage requirements, um, insurance is closely connected with mortgage markets. Anyone who has a mortgage in the US has to maintain property insurance. And in this kind of direct way, uh, insurance kind of directly underpins what is a multi-trillion dollar mortgage finance system. Now, mortgage lending um, is a, an important asset class which feeds into all sorts of financial processes and securitization, think about the big short. And that is important in its own right in the context of our financialized economy. In places like the US and the UK, finance is by far the largest economy now and mortgage securitization and the types of financial engineering and speculation that attend to that are a really big component of that, right? Real estate more broadly is a really important asset class and an increasingly important asset class in financial markets. But in a much more ordinary sense, mortgage lending connects to housing markets. And housing markets underpin all sorts of activity. Um, working from the bottom up, over the last few decades, we've seen um, a shift in labor markets and the economy more broadly, such that housing is, is a really important um, driver of household wealth. Um, offsetting um, income from labor, you see housing play an increasingly important role in promoting consumer spending and upholding uh, the kind of debt-based economy in places like the U.S. You also see that the real estate and housing sector is a really important um, source of employment. Um, construction, real estate, building, they are often directly um, the largest economic sectors in urban regions, and they indirectly support all sorts of other industries. This is particularly the case in Florida. Um, you know, think about uh, connections to architecture, to, you know, landscaping, um, to all of the services which support that industry. And housing also really underpins property values and uh, the local fiscal capacity of, of municipalities. Um, in the US, it's very common for local governments to finance a large share of their services through property taxation, which relies on stable, if not growing, property values. Now, this is really the case in Florida, where there's no state income tax. That means that governments essentially run themselves on property tax, on property markets. And so there's a, a series of interdependence, interdependencies here, which all come back to insurance. Now, we can think about that comment from the executive next to this comment from um, the Florida Insurance Commissioner at the time. And at the State Insurance Summit at Disney World, of course, in 2015, he had this to say, he says, we're in a position in reinsurance markets that we've never before been in, in Bermuda, in London, across the world in terms of investment opportunities. Huge changes are taking place that are transforming the pricing and transforming how we do business. And he mentioned specifically, insurance linked securities have dramatically changed the marketplace and we believe will benefit the Florida domestic market. So this is really interesting because on the one hand, we have a narrative that insurance is the linchpin of, of the resilience of Florida's real estate sector and their economy in general, and that they're going to be the drivers and that this is a potentially unstable force. And on the other hand, we see financial innovation apparently putting Florida in a place that it's never been in. Um, there's a lot implied here and I wanna unpack this and define what, what's going on here. So when the commissioner was talking about insurance linked securities or ILS, he was talking about a financial instrument that looks like this. Um, there are a couple of varieties in terms of the, what the instruments look like, but this is a kind of common structure. 
Don't get bogged down in the details. Um, that's not too important. But what you need to know here is that ILS is a, a financial instrument that turns insured risk into an asset class that investors like pension funds can invest in. And that means also that the investment capital from pension funds can become insurance protection. So in theory, um, an insurance company takes premium dollars paid um, every year by their policyholders and pays them to uh, institutional investors in exchange for a promise to pay. In the event of a disaster, this provides an extra source of capital, which trickles down and allows um, companies to, to pay their policyholders if there's a disaster. So some scholars have begun to think about ILS, um, Lee Johnson, most prominently a geographer. And Lee argues that um, ILS represents a catastrophic fix. So for them, drawing on you know, David Harvey's work, there is a crisis of overaccumulation in capital markets, which means that all of this money around the world, particularly after the financial crisis, is looking for a place to go. It needs a place to be invested. And here we have a new asset class, insurance-linked securities, and it's a new place to park money. Right? And for Lee, um, this means that disaster risk um, provides a, a fix, a momentary relief. Um, for capital, looking for returns. But she also speculates that this crisis might be displaced to the built environment, right? That perhaps this inward flow of capital into the insurance sector might keep insurance rates low so that insurance is being sold um, at a cost that is too low. That too much capital might mean that some places continue to um, develop in problematic ways. And should that capital disappear, we might have a problem down the line. It's a really compelling thesis and it's a great paper, really foundational, but Lee doesn't engage with Florida in this conversation. And that's really interesting um, because Florida is, uh, it turns out digging deeper in my field work uh, at the time, uh, Florida represents half to two thirds of ILS markets. Um, Florida plays a really important role in the history of this market. And underpinning this market are very specific types of real estate that are insured in very specific ways. So this got me thinking, you know, what if we understood ILS not just as a crisis in capital markets, but as a convergence between dynamics that are happening in capital markets and problems that exist in the built environment. And that's where I want us to uh, begin this journey today by thinking about ILS as one, but potentially multiple or one of many real estate risk fixes. So here I'm riffing on Lee and on David Harvey and thinking about the real estate risk fix as a two part process. So the first fix is very much the one that Lee Johnson was talking about. And that's the role of ILS as, as a risk capital transformer, right? Turning investor capital into protection capital for insurance markets, but also turning policyholder uh, risks into an investment class, that two-way process. And as I'm gonna show, it marketizes billions of dollars of Florida hurricane catastrophe risk every year. Um, it channels that capital to the insurance sector in Florida, enabling the real estate sector to continue as if there aren't stronger hurricanes out there, but it also feeds investors with capacity to invest in. And I wanna step back and think about that more broadly as a second fix as a fix for the fix. And what I mean here is uh, that we have in, in, in contemporary political economy, particularly in the US and the UK, uh, a dependence within um, our economy on real estate and finance. And within that, particularly in the US, there's a dependence on insurance and reinsurance to finance risk and to finance risky real estate, right? And so I wanna think about ILS as a fix uh, a fix for this fix. For David Harvey, um, the original concept of the spatial fix uh, referred to the ways in which crises in capital markets um, drive capital into the built environment, right? So money flows in and out of uh, real estate, infrastructure, the built world as a way to kind of manage crises of capital, right? And so in this way, 
we can think about this as a way of, of fixing that original fix. I wanna locate this story in Florida and do so by thinking about four interlocking uh, crises of exposure, of calculation, capital, and returns. And what I wanna do here is show over time how interlocking, interrelated um, dynamics play out in Florida and in capital markets and in insurance markets in particular, and how together these things have centered ILS as a, a fix in Florida and how that works, how it looks, what it means materially. And I wanna theorize from that. So the first crisis is of exposure. It takes us back to 1992 when Hurricane Andrew makes a, an unexpectedly powerful landfall just south of Miami. Um, at the time, it was the most destructive natural disaster in the US. Um, it, it killed many people and left hundreds of thousands of homes um, damaged or, or uninhabitable. And it triggered a, a dual crisis. The first one was for the insurance sector directly. Um, the insurers in the state had really failed to account for their, their exposure to hurricane wind. Um, they had systematically um, uh, underestimated the possibility and the cost of a disaster like Andrew happening. And as a result, um, they hadn't priced the risk appropriately. Uh, they hadn't purchased the right amount of uh, reinsurance or insurance for insurance companies. And as a result, they struggled to pay their claims. Um, multiple firms were declared insolvent and catastrophe reinsurance rates, uh, they skyrocket. The firms that remain in Florida um, cut back on the number of policies they offered. They reduced their underwriting and they look to raise their insurance rates to, to make up those losses. And this, I think, also prompted a crisis for Florida's real estate sector. Uh, you know, nearly overnight, uh, residential insurance costs become one of the, the greatest single drivers of home ownership costs in Florida. And that threatens home values and the property market. Now, I, as I explained earlier on, this is really problematic because real estate is the, the single largest economic sector in the state, and it, it underpins the capacity of local governments to provide services. So in response to this, uh, Florida uh, elected officials undertook a series of interventions. Uh, it's a complex story, um, but really tried to find and experiment with different ways over many years um, to stabilize insurance rates um, against an Andrew-like event happening again. So after many years, after the dust settles, um, the state ends up with uh, a primary insurance company. So a, a, a state-owned company that complements um, a main street insurer that, that you and I would buy our insurance from called Citizens. Um, they also ended up with a reinsurer or um, a, a special fund that provided hurricane insurance to other uh, insurers in the state. They also ended up with a, a guarantor, uh, which, um, effectively means that you know, if, if an insurance company goes under, the state is willing to, to step in and pay those claims to policyholders and a lot of other market shaping mechanisms. And this is really important as I'll get into a little bit later um, because the state ends up being a major actor in this story of ILS. Parallel to this crisis of exposure, there's also what I call a crisis of calculation. Um, the methods that insurers used before Hurricane Andrew uh, relied on historic loss records. And as I mentioned before, those really failed to take into account the high rates of urbanization that you see in places like Florida, where you know, population rates just you know, profoundly grew. You know, at, at one point near the last, um, the global financial crisis before that, People used to say that a thousand new people moved to Florida every day to give you a, a sense of how significant this growth uh, is. So reinsurers had systematically undervalued their exposure and they needed to find a new way to get back on top of this. Uh, and in this context, um, catastrophe risk models, uh, which at the time were, were quite innovative and new, uh, became widely adopted. And what's interesting about these is they're, they're forward-looking stochastic models which simulate 
um, thousands of possible events. Um, they exist for all sorts of perils, but were originally conceptualized and developed in relationship to hurricane risk. Um, I won't go into exactly how it works, but models take a lot of information about hazards, so something like a hurricane um, and the physical geography on which a hurricane you know, might interact with, information about um, how things are built. So um, you know, what's a construction stand of, of the properties that are in harm's way there? Um, what are the terms of the policy? Um, under what circumstances are damages protected? How much? And then the models can, can integrate information from their users, from say an insurer about their finances. And models provide a way for insurers to um, understand the financial ramifications of, of potential disasters. So um, a low probability major hurricane can create uh, this amount of, of economic losses um, for our firm. And based on that information, the insurer can make all sorts of financial decisions. They can uh, reduce the number of policies they have in a place. They can ask to charge more for those policies uh, from their regulator, um, pass on the bill. They can um, save more money uh, that they that, um, earn from you. Um, they can um, buy more reinsurance. There's all sorts of ramifications from these models. And beyond that transformation inside the insurance industry in terms of how uh, catastrophe risk was actuarially valued, models also did a lot of really important work in, in changing um, the industry more broadly, right? So we can think about this as a, a new vocabulary of risk, a new way to um, uh, objectify and calculate risk with authority. And I, I have argued that this contributes to a new paradigm of risk management, uh, which is focused on capitalizing um, these kind of uh, low probability, high loss uh, events by using things like ILFs. And there's more to this story um, about how that works out, but you know, uh, catastrophe risk models and providing an objective handle on risks, I, I really provided a way for um, regulators to better understand um, actuarial risks and to design regulations um, in conversation with the industry. Um, they've also enabled financial institutions that are not in the insurance sector to understand risk better, right? So um, investors in uh, ILS markets um, can um, you know, also rely on these models to understand their risk exposure, and that can be used to negotiate the price of insurance protection um, in that context. So a really important device for making possible um, a new way of understanding catastrophe risk and for financing it. And the third kind of crisis that comes out of this post Andrew juncture is what could be called the crisis of capital. And Andrew and subsequent disasters, particularly the Northridge earthquake um, near LA uh, in the 90s, uh, revealed that there was a structural limit to how much the reinsurance industry could absorb these high loss, low probability events. So as one industry insider says uh, to me, you know, 80% uh, of the risk is in 20% of the locations. It's a horizontal problem. That's why they call it peak peril, right? Think about it like skyscrapers on a coast, he says. But the insurance industry is, he argues, horizontal. It spreads risk. The idea is to de-risk and deconcentrate risk by uh, transferring it from insurer to reinsurer and sometimes from reinsurer to reinsurer and on to investors. But that sector was unable institutionally to absorb all of the risk in places like Florida. Even today, uh, reinsurance firms have estimated that a really bad Miami hurricane could um, cause uh, upwards of $100 billion in insured losses. Uh, that would potentially wipe out you know, up to a fifth of all of the capital in the industry in a single event. So it's, it's a really significant financing conundrum for them. To address this, um, the industry began to explore new ways of raising capital from the 1990s onwards. 
And the idea here was that by diversifying the capital providers, they could de-risk um, this set of financial relationships. And so the idea here was to bring in new institutions outside of the insurance industry, like pension funds, and make them de facto reinsurers by using instruments um, like ILS. Um, catastrophe bonds, one type of ILS, were the first one that they used. Now, of course, this didn't happen overnight. Um, you know, these geographies of risk and capital emerge and expand as special, uh, specialist investment funds and new types of instruments are pitched to investors. Um, there's a really gradual process of bringing on capital market investors to understand catastrophe risk, um, to pitch it. And the real hook here, um, one that continues to be compelling to investors, is the idea that uh, catastrophe risk is an alternative beta. And what they mean by that is that it's not correlated with the ebbs and flows of the broader economy. So whether or not there is a, a, a financial crisis or a depression or a recession, catastrophe risk is independent of that. So the argument goes. And that provides a way to um, de-risk the portfolios of, of like pension funds and other capital providers by diversifying what they invest in. Um, at the same time, uh, networks, offshore geographies emerged to make it possible to trade ILS products. Um, Bermuda would emerge at the core, but in recent years, places like Singapore and soon Hong Kong um, have emerged as places to um, uh, issue ILS products. And these are really important because these are places where uh, there are favorable regulatory conditions, minimal scrutiny, limited tax liabilities. Um, this makes it cost effective and profitable to set up these kind of special purpose vehicles, the security instruments to invest in risk. And this too had to be built. Now, the growth of this sector remained pretty modest until around 2004 and 2005, when a series of major hurricanes make landfall in the US. Um, of course, Hurricane Katrina is maybe the one that uh, sticks out to those of you in the audience most starkly, but also several hurricanes hit Florida over that period, um, causing um, losses that, that really rivaled those of Andrew. And what this did is um, essentially deplete the reinsurance uh, capacity in the market. Um, as claims are paid, um, new, new reinsurance cap, uh, capital needs to be raised and uh, rates go up. And this rate hike attracts investors. Um, they start flooding the market. After 2008 and the financial crisis, um, this capital decides to stick around because it needs um, a, a new source of, of collateral, a, a place to park itself. Um, and there's more to say about that, but I'll spare you for now. Um, so after this context, you know, we see in a, around a 10 year period up to 2008, ILS issuance really significantly expands um, and it outpaces the reinsurance sector's growth by sevenfold. So insofar as this appeared to resolve the crisis of capital inside the, inside the insurance industry, what ended up happening is that there was too much capital, right? An outsized influx of capital from investors sparked a crisis of returns, of profitability concerns for traditional reinsurers. So between the same time period uh, over which ILS grew, we see reinsurance rates decline by um, almost 40% worldwide, US rates even higher declines. And this created what one insurance executive called a knife fight as uh, reinsurance companies uh, look to pair their uh, capital with risks in places like Florida. So there, there are a series of mergers and acquisitions, partnerships, uh, the use of new technology, all sorts of interventions to try to secure those ever thinning returns from the market because there's just simply too much capital to go around. And here is a, an interesting twist as the sector comes back to Florida. So as those returns are deteriorating, Investors and reinsurers looked to the state to source new risk, which at the time, um, there could be uh, really significant troves tracked within the, the portfolios of those local insurers. 
So a little bit of context here, what I mean. After Andrew, the Florida market um, landscape shifted from large national insurers, so that wrote business in Florida and Georgia and New York and California to a relatively um, more uh, specialized uh, set of insurers called the specialists, which were, um, which are, they're still around, firms which really specialize uh, almost exclusively in Florida homeowners insurance risk. Uh, maybe some uh, exceptions to that. And, and these firms make up an increasingly important um, part of the market. Um, and they held inside their books um, concentrations of hurricane risk, which are historically those which have been difficult to profitably underwrite. And this includes um, Citizens, the state-run insurer, which exists to absorb all of the policies that the private insurance industry doesn't want to write. And at the time, Citizens was the largest insurance company in Florida. So that, that shows you how difficult um, it was at the time to profitably uh, write those policies for um, private firms. But despite this problem, um, Florida wind risk was a tried and true basis of risk. People knew it. Um, it was the, the, um, the basis for catastrophe bond markets in the first instance. And so over time, we see ILS um, begin to be uh, a much more important and visible feature of the insurance market. So the year that the Florida Insurance Commissioner talked about what was going on in ILS and reinsurance markets, we see some interesting things happen. I um, conducted a forensic analysis of 28 of the specialist firms. Uh, together, they wrote about half of the Florida homeowners insurance market. And I looked at how they spent money on um, reinsurance. And looking at their financial statements, traced that they spent 50 cents of every dollar they earned from policy holders, from people like uni, um, equal to about $3 billion on reinsurance. That uh, flowed to um, 36 jurisdictions, as they're called in insurance jargon. So that could be New York, or it could be Bermuda, or the UK, to 164 distinct reinsurance companies. Now, of this, um, at least $530 million in premium went to ILS funds directly. Um, that's a definitely a conservative estimate, given some of the difficulties of, of um, following the money in this context, because not everything is a public record, but that is hypothetically enough to purchase eight to $10 billion of protection from uh, ILS uh, investors. That's about a third of the market at the time. So we see here how a, a really specific group of firms with a very specific um, underwriting um, uh, basis in Florida residential property have really become a kind of constitutive and important piece of ILS markets. Now, a few more things I want to briefly comment on. Um, you know, this didn't happen um, overnight and it didn't happen by accident. Um, the state of Florida played a really important role in making this happen directly and indirectly. Um, and they, they began to channel risk to reinsurers, making possible this link. So for example, um, citizens, uh, and later the, the catastrophe fund um, begin issuing multiple and at times record setting catastrophe bond uh, issuances. They begin to um, purchase reinsurance at, at a large scale. Um, public policies also do something called, uh, they, they depopulate citizens, which means um, they make it possible for private insurers to select their choice of policies from the state insurer in exchange for a subsidy. And so we see over a multi-year period, hundreds of billions of dollars of residential um, exposure move from the state's insurance uh, books to private firms. Um, we also see more recently the state becoming an investor in ILS markets, using uh, retirement funds to buy ILS products. And there are other ways that the more indirectly, the state really has sanctioned and really constituted this market. Now, at the same time, on the other side of the equation, we see some really interesting private market uh, maneuvers. Um, multiple specialist firms were um, either established or 
uh, really entirely retooled to um, assume risk from citizens. So we have companies that were created to take advantage of this opportunity to get access to citizens. Now this becomes important because at the same time, we see that of these companies, there are extensive ties from the uh, executive leadership teams, from the boards, um, and, and in their, on their balance sheets from their owners between um, them and uh, reinsurance firms and ILS firms. And we also see some former state officials appear here, right? And in this context, new business models take root. Uh, one of them is fronting, uh, in which um, a company, a specialist in this case, assumes uh, risk through policyholders um, expressly for the purpose of passing it on to reinsurers. So, you know, normally you buy a policy from an insurance company. And while that company might use reinsurance to manage their risk, you know, they hold your risk, they own your risk. But in this case, the firm exists as a conduit, as a pass-through between policyholders and capital markets. And they do that in exchange for commissions. Now, this is what Lee Johnson um, calls an underwrite to securitize regime. And in this context, we see um, a growing volume of premium dollars from policyholders flow from Florida offshore to places like Bermuda for securitization. And this is quite similar to um, the originate to securitize uh, mortgage lending model that ultimately fueled the subprime uh, mortgage and foreclosure crisis. Um, and it's, it's a tricky one to evaluate. Um, market proponents uh, would contend that um, this arrangement is practical. It, it capitalizes Florida's insurance industry. Uh, it makes firms more resilient by externalizing that high concentration of catastrophe risk that needs to be um, managed, they would contend. And so this is really doing a, a great service to the state of Florida. It's enabling business as usual to be uh, you know, reproduced. But it also reflects how the state's structural dependence on insurance um, is exploited to feed risk to capital markets, which increasingly demand that uh, investable capacity. And you know, more broadly, I think it shows a model that, that defers responsibility for managing climate risk to financial markets. So briefly, I wanna begin to uh, wrap up and think about some of the tensions and contradictions that appear here. The first one is this recurring tension in Florida, but also really in any context where we're talking about um, insurance between affordability or profitability. Um, is the, the purpose here um, to maintain a product that everyone can rely on, um, or is it to create a, a, a source of profit for financial firms? And that's the question that has really faced Florida regulators and has guided um, how and why they've intervened in the market. Now, over time, the approach of the state of Florida has definitely varied in the horizon I've covered, but I would argue that the more recent arrangement is really orientated more towards um, sustaining the profitability of the um, private insurance system. But of course, this raises a lot of questions. So uh, contradictions begin to emerge here. Um, for example, um, you know, what becomes of uh, housing affordability if insurance rates are allowed to increase um, endlessly? So as insurance companies begin to marketize this uh, uh, growing understanding or growing appreciations of climate risk and raise insurance rates, you know, eventually um, this is going to feed back into housing markets. Um, Florida has among the highest insurance rates in the US. Um, it's not uncommon in places like Miami to hear of annual mortgage or uh, insurance uh, payments of many, many thousands of dollars uh, exceeding uh, multiple mortgage payments. Um, this is a huge cost of home ownership. So, you know, as homeowners in some cases struggle, uh, and we know this, um, certain places, uh, places uh, people really struggle to afford their homes, um, even those with mortgages, you know, what happens as those rates continue to increase? There's a, a really intractable tension here 
that comes to a head in, in moments of crisis. And we see that um, happening now. Um, after hurricanes Irma, Harvey, and Maria um, in 2017, and with the onset of, of the COVID crisis and its impacts on the insurance sector in 2020, um, insurers in Florida find that um, catastrophe reinsurance is again expensive, and they're responding by um, seeking significant rate increases, 10 or 20% in some cases. They are responding by reducing the uh, um, number of policies they uh, offer in the market. And in some cases, they're responding by purchasing less reinsurance, you know, potentially foregoing some protection. So there are a lot of tensions and, and contradictions here. Closely related to that is the question of capital durability. Uh, and what I mean here is, um, to what extent does the capital that uh, flows into this sector uh, stick around? Does it last? Um, does this arrangement work for the long term? Um, what we saw after the uh, 2017 losses um, and as other disasters happened um, beyond hurricane losses in the Atlantic, um, think about you know, Australian bushfires, uh, typhoon in Japan, in other contexts, um, wildfires in California, um, as these losses accumulate um, and, and erode the profitability of reinsurance investment more broadly, um, I think there are questions about whether or not all of the investment capital is willing to stick around. Um, does it leave? Does it become too unprofitable? For now, we're definitely seeing instances where um, some investors have pulled back, but new investors have come in. But as risks rise both in Florida and in other places, and because these are system, uh, systemically connected uh, risk exposures through insurance markets, there does a day come when that capital is no longer available. And uh, this is something that Lee Johnson has um, begun to think about in, in her original um, catastrophic fix thesis, right? And the instinct here, and I think she's right in her thesis, is that should that um, insurance co investment capacity retreat, insurance costs are going to go up um, and only the most lucrative risks are going to be covered by the market, which is going to leave increasing uh, shares of property um, uninsurable or left to the state to insure. And for her, this could uh, create or, or deepen forms of splintering protectionism, right? So you get really sort of uneven or increasingly uneven levels of, of financial protection uh, within housing and property markets. And this feeds into the third and final tension uh, that I wanna throw out to think about. And that's about whether or not we uh, rely on extractive or transformative ways of, of financing catastrophe risk. Now, I don't think that it's quite so easy to uh, ascribe one of these two um, uh, to reinsurance markets, they, they provide a really important function uh, and a solidaristic means of financing risk in our society. But we do see um, speculative and extractive impulses or tendencies in this example. And I think the subset of firms that um, engage in that underwriting to securitize, that really raises a lot of questions about um, how the value that is um, being uh, moved from homeowners to investors is mobilized. Is this an efficient and equitable way of financing climate risk? So in Florida, you know, homeowners pay over $10 billion a year uh, for their um, insurance policies. And you see the state still continue to uh, defer most of its responsibilities for helping local governments to finance risk reduction. So risk is being transferred at great cost, but that risk is not fundamentally being addressed. It's not being mitigated. And this tension between risk transfer and, and um, risk mitigation um, is, is, I think, a really, really important one. And it raises the question of, can this capital, can this expertise, this way of understanding risk, of financing risk, of valuing and, and governing it, can it be used um, to enable more transformative ways of managing risk? And here I mean, you know, can it be used to help um, incentivize at, at, in the most conservative way to incentivize mitigation? 
right, to reduce that risk rather than to continue to finance it externally. Now, of course, I think I would be remiss without saying that um, I would like to propose that we think about ILS and reinsurance as, as one form of a real estate risk fix, as one way of dealing with the contradictory uh, relationships between our dependence on real estate and the exposure of real estate markets to climate risk. There are certainly other fixes uh, which can be um, seen emerging um, in other places and in other segments of the real estate and financial system. So as Alice noted, um, I've been doing research in places like uh, Singapore, where we see a, a similar sort of property state um, as, as the late scholar Ann Hyla called it, um, which means that you know, property real estate plays a really important uh, formative role in, in um, the making of the economy and state power here too. But we don't see a big insurance market, not at all. Um, we see the state um, uh, pursue a much more um, infrastructural approach to managing uh, climate risk. There are some important distinctions between the two, but I think that's a useful way to understand or to begin to think about how in different property regimes, in different urban contexts, how we might arrive at different systems. You know, similarly, the, the UK has a, um, a flood insurance scheme called Flood Re, which combines um, insurance underwriting for consumers with uh, infrastructure investments, and they go hand in hand. Um, there's also increasing examples of, of how financial institutions beyond the insurance sector are thinking about climate risk and developing fixes or solutions um, or, or at the very least strategies for understanding the problem. Um, so another place I, I've been doing research is in relationship to institutional real estate investment. So um, looking at things like um, pension funds, which invest in property through asset managers, uh, which in turn uh, acquire properties around the world. Um, how in that context do they understand um, their exposure to climate risk? Um, how are they adjusting their investment strategies? Um, in that case, uh, we see new mapping and modeling techniques emerging, um, many of which come from the insurance sector, uh, which is very interesting, which are helping those firms to begin to make decisions about uh, where they invest. Do they avoid investing in certain places? Do they um, retrofit their buildings? Um, do they look to invest in new places that might be more resilient over the long term. And while this isn't the only example of, of a, a different type of risk fix emerging across the real estate finance system, this alone, uh, I think, also suggests potentially you know, really big changes in terms of how capital is moved into the built environment, the implications of which are potentially quite significant when we think about how important real estate is within our political economies. And of course, there are limits to this risk fix in Florida. Um, what I've talked about here um, is a market which fundamentally um, protects homeowners with mortgages. Um, if you're a renter in Florida, um, you know, you're not included in this story, although there are millions of, of, of renters. And so it's, a, it's an incomplete fix. It's a partial fix. It's a fragile fix. It's a shifting one, and it's one of many that are emerging in relationship to this problem. But I think it's a, a fascinating model. Um, it's, a, it's one which is being exported to other places, to other geographies. Um, and it's really shaping how not only reinsurers, but other financial institutions, uh, philanthropic organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, multilateral institutions like the World Bank, how they think about climate risk and how they see finance addressing that. So it's an important case and um, one that I am excited to um, continue to look into and to talk about now. So if we have some time, I would love to uh, take some questions and clarify anything that I said. I kind of flew through that, but thanks for um, sticking with me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, and as we were talking, um, there were some questions and comments uh, coming in already. So if you do have questions, please kind of just keep popping them into the chat box and I'll put them forward. Um, okay, 
Ready to get started on that? Perfect. Bring it on. All right. Okay. So what about the tenures of those high rises? I guess some overseas buyers could buy property outright without a mortgage. And do the developers maintain an interest in the property after sale, or is it a build and leave as quickly as possible model? That's a great question. And um, that's the subject of the paper that I want to review right now. <laughs> so it's a really uh, timely one, one I'm thinking about a lot. So yeah, um, I alluded to that a little bit at the end when I was talking about how you know, this is something that really is connected to um, this insurance model to particular tenures, to particular types of housing. Um, and in many ways, it could be traced back to that classic single family housing, um, you know, owner occupied on cold sacks. But of course there are um, condominium owners that have mortgages that could be included. But yes, when we're looking at that, for example, a picture I showed from Surfside, where there's that really like slick wall of skyscrapers next to the water, you know, that is a place that's really dominated by um, overseas investment. Um, a lot of it comes from Latin America, but also in that particular place um, from Russia, um, there are a couple of Trump towers there. I'm not going to get into that anymore. Make of that what you will. Um, but yeah, a lot of that capital um, tends to be more risk agnostic, right? In some cases, it's um, fleeing high risk settings. You know, when, when you are um, a, a wealthy person in, in Latin America and you're concerned about protecting your money, um, you, you move it overseas sometimes. And Miami real estate is, in this context, a very important and special um, outlet for that. Uh, it's not unlike the story that we see in London, where money is moved into um, real estate to shelter it. That's definitely the case in Florida. Um, in other cases, um, it's a matter of, of um, you know, wealthy individuals choosing to self-insure. Even if they are conscious of the risk, um, they accept it. Because this isn't about an investment, this is about where they live and the quality of life that they want to have. So they choose to be there anyway. And there are many, many other permutations to that story. On the development side, um, yeah, most of the conventional real estate business um, in Florida is short termist. Um, you know, you develop, it depends on your horizon, but say you acquire a property, you hold on to it for a few years, um, you build the project that gets financed with. Um, uh, construction loans, which might be three or five or seven years, and you sell out and you're done. And that means that the developer and the um, institutions which are financing that development do not have a long-term stake um, in that um, project. Now, there are some exceptions to that. There are long-term um, you know, capital providers and investors, um, but they're often investing in commercial real estate, things like you know, hotels or shopping malls. And they might have a longer term interest. And again, there's more to add about that, but yeah, it's really important to think about um, tenure, um, to think about the vintage of, of finance that, that is going into development, um, because you see that all of these different ways of owning and building and financing development are all, even in the same place, um, they are all exposed to climate risk and climate risk management in different ways. So this story really is one that comes down to how particular residential properties are financed and insured, right? And that story might be, and it is indeed different if we were to think about a different type of real estate. And I think that's really interesting. You know, even properties next door to each other are entangled in these financial relationships um, in different ways. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a comment here. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the Green Building Council conference in Toronto. Very much like your picture, there was a wall of high-rise residential development going up. There were concerns about the microclimate, that the wall of high-rise was blocking cooling air for the rest of the city, and concerns that in the case of a power cut, older people would be trapped. In that case, in a rapidly cooling, but could also be rapidly overheating, tall building. Nearby in Hamilton, they were also looking at passive house because of the risks to older people being trapped without power in a building that quickly cools. I don't know if you have any yeah. reflections. 
I think that's a really interesting and illuminating um, comment, you know, especially as this idea of densification um, and, and um, high rise living is, I think, part of our imagination of sustainability. But there are a lot of contradictions that come with this. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to maintain that broader view. You know, what you just described are potentially a lot of equity impacts associated with that, you know, especially if we're thinking about um, heating and, um, you know, the, the negative effects of, of heating um, in cities. You know, we have a lot of research that shows that low-income communities, communities of color, particularly in the U.S., they're the places that don't have um, the, the green cover, um, the open space, um, access to waterfronts, the things that, um, you know, cool places down. So there are a lot of dimensions that we need to be thinking about. And of course, there are contradictions and, you know, uh, liability issues and beyond that come from um, the failures of these buildings too. There's also a really interesting piece, um, if folks haven't seen it, in the, I think it was the New York Times recently, describing life inside um, a new super high rise building in, in Manhattan. It's over a thousand feet tall and um, it's filled with mechanical failures. And it's a place that JLo owned an apartment and all sorts of other characters. And it's very interesting to get an inside glimpse at how these ultra wealthy people navigate um, this sort of quasi failed development. Um, but indeed, um, things are not always rosy um, in the, the high rise life. Thank you. Um, I guess there was a, another question um, about, um, could you kind of talk about, we often hear the, the phrase climate gentrification. Can you kind of expand on how that kind of connects to some of the issues you've been discussing? Yeah, um, that's a, a really, really great question. Um, so climate gentrification is a concept that's been explored by scholars in a number of cities at this point. Um, Barcelona, Philadelphia um, are, are among places with, um, I think, prominent studies. And the idea here is that um, uh, attempts to um, manage uh, climate change or adapt to climate change in cities can create unintended um, negative repercussions for uh, vulnerable communities. Um, you know, a classic example would be that, you know, providing parks um, as a, uh, an amenity as a, uh, a lung for open space, as something which has all sorts of, of different health and environmental benefits, building those in cities um, can create gentrification. And that can often lead to the displacement of low-income people. And we see similar examples which have to do with environmental remediation or putting in uh, resilient infrastructure, um, that often these things which are meant to make a city a better place, a more you know, climate sensitive place, a more you know, resilient place, have that negative impact. It's a, a topic that has been quite a lot in Miami also. And here you see a, a quite specific um, and unusual situation where the places that are, are most um, exposed to sea level rise induced flooding are the coastal areas. Now, this is a little bit unusual in a lot of places, um, historically, uh, vulnerable communities have lived in places that are environmentally very fragile. They've, they've lived in the places that uh, flood a lot, that are next to toxins. But in Miami, you get an interesting situation where the wealth is concentrated in the most fragile, uh, in terms of flooding, place. And so the argument here is that um, as uh, understandings of sea level rise and flood risk uh, grow, um, market actors, particularly developers, are looking to higher elevation regions in, um, in, in Miami to acquire property, betting that there's going to be demand for, um, you know, places with natural resilience benefits for future development. And in Miami, those places are um, low-income communities of color predominantly. And there's a, a lot of history to talk about here but we're seeing emerging evidence of um, that capital moving potentially from lower elevation areas into higher elevation, lower income communities, creating displacement pressures. Um, it's a difficult and thorny um, issue to unpack. There's a lot of dynamics here. And although that's the one that's been focused on, 
um, you know, there are a lot of other gentrification like things happening in Miami's real estate market, uh, which have to do with climate risk. Um, you know, potentially we could think about um, what's happening in insurance markets as a form of gentrification. We could think about insurance um, and, and risk as um, in terms of rent that we see uh, risk uh, rents being um, derived from um, households. And while this isn't the, necessarily the conventional story of gentrification, you know, as insurers seek greater and greater climate risk rents, as uh, policies uh, become more expensive, as housing becomes more unaffordable, you know, we might see households um, uh, sell out. We might see housing become more unaffordable. In a worst case scenario, we might see um, uh, housing abandoned. We might see foreclosure. Um, all of these could create forms of uh, disinvestment um, that might lead to things like tenure change. So maybe areas become uh, less dominated by um, owner occupiers and by renters. Um, they could also create opportunities for reinvestment, but they restructure relationships. And I think that's really the essence of, of gentrification debates. So there's a lot to say there, but you know, Miami is a very powerful place to understand the different permutations between real estate and finance and climate risk and how those play out in relationship to different types of neighborhoods, different types of housing. Um, and it's, it's a really powerful, uh, I think, conversation and it's very rightly um, galvanized a lot of attention um, to uh, force us to think about the equity impacts of, of climate adaptation, of real estate markets and how they work together. And so if you're interested in this, I would definitely recommend looking at um, the work of community organizations in Miami, like the Miami Climate Alliance, um, which has done um, a very interesting work trying to put together anti-displacement um, um, policy tools um, to address climate gentrification. And that's really putting housing and housing justice and housing equity at the heart of climate planning. And so there's a lot to, to learn about and to think about in that context. And I think that that really resonates with and gets at what I was alluding to with the, the, the final kind of tension about whether or not we want our, um, our, our climate risk finance system to be you know, extractive or transformative. You know, what are the values that we're gonna put at the heart of that? But yeah, that's a great question. Thank Sorry, you. very long answer. No, that's, that's great. Um, okay, we have a question here. Could insurers reduce risk and increase investment returns by investing in companies that improve infrastructure resilience or that directly reduce the risk of climate change impacts, for example, carbon capture or greenhouse gas removal? I mean, I think that, that there are so many ways in which the insurance industry could be involved in um, mitigating risks. And that could be, um, yeah, by, by, as you say, investing. Um, it could also be in um, different risk reduction financing models. So on the investment side, um, you know, conventionally insurance companies make money by um, earning your premium, taking that premium, that money, and uh, they do reinsure a little bit of it. Um, they do save a little bit because they have to for solvency reasons. Um, you know, they have to have their own skin in the game. They have to save some cash for a rainy day. But then they also typically take that money and they invest it in the market. And that's how a conventional insurance company makes money. And, you know, there are a lot of questions that are emerging about how insurance uh, firms, um, you know, either fuel climate change or, or enable problematic industries to continue. And as that pressure and that scrutiny is applied to the sector, um, you know, which is definitely a hot topic of conversation right now, you could see insurers committing more of their own investment capital into things which are understood to have a, a positive, what's in the sector called ESG uh, benefit, you know, a positive um, environmental and social uh, impact. On the risk reduction side, you know, there have been a lot of conversations about and examples of, of insurance-based mechanisms that are designed to finance risk reduction. So uh, the insurance industry has proposed um, new financial instruments like the catastrophe bond, uh, basically a form of, of ILS called the resilience bond. 
And this would um, in theory be taken out by local governments to protect their infrastructure. And um, if local governments invest in risk reduction measures that reduce their overall exposure as a place, in theory, they would get reductions in their premium, right? So there would be, there, there's an implicit sort of um, financing component to that, a sort of reward for good behavior. Now that model exists um, in, in the US in the form of the National Flood Insurance Program, which is um, a, a public program, um, but is uh, quite complicated and, and facing lots of calls for reform. And one interesting element of that program, despite its many works, is called the community rating system. And what that does is it, it rewards um, local governments that um, invest in um, flood risk reduction projects. And that could be anything from building infrastructure to removing properties from floodplains to just educating people about their flood risk. And when communities participate in that system, um, the more they participate and the more they earn points, the more that people who live there get discounts on their insurance premiums. And this is interesting because it ties risk reduction with uh, you know, risk financing. It incentivizes good behavior. And I think there's a lot to learn from that model, thinking about you know, how to more directly connect um, you know, what you pay with your risk exposure. Because right now, these are, these are disconnected things. You know, in theory, if you, you, with some exceptions, if you reduce the risk to your property, you know, you know, do you necessarily see that return on investment? And I think there's a lot of space for um, uh, you know, financial tinkering and public policy to come together to create good incentives that make sure that people can um, access capital to reduce the risk of, of their home or their community and that they're rewarded for it, right? It's a great question. And I think, you know, for all of the, yeah, um, this, this presentation is in paper that it's based on our a little tough on the industry maybe, um, but I think there's a wealth of uh, wisdom there that could be applied to helping to um, make this system, these systems work better. Thank you. And actually uh, somebody else popped in a link to an example from Anglian Water. Um, and their green bonds scheme. So that's in the chat box if anyone wants to have a look at that. Um, I think we've got some other comments saying that it was a really interesting talk. Um, some folks actually having to leave because of curfews and having to leave buildings, um, which has pretty solid 2021 vibes. Um, but um, do you, um, I don't know if, if anyone has any final questions or if Zach from those questions, there's anything that you just want to kind of finish up by mentioning. Um, I noticed you've popped up uh, some of your recent publications and that's really helpful, I think. Um, and definitely once um, the recording goes up on YouTube, of course, everyone can hopefully head over to listen to podcasts, essays, read articles galore. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much um, to, to Zach for coming along um, and for everyone else for giving up some of their Tuesday evening to come and join us for this discussion. Yeah, thanks. It was a pleasure to be here and um, also trapped at home thanks to curfews, so I relate. And um, thanks for the great questions and participation. And thank you so much, Alice, for um, the invitation to come and be with you in spirit. Um, it's really nice to reconnect and to, uh, to share this with uh, the world. So I look forward to seeing it online and to potentially hearing from um, those of you in the audience you know, on social media or over email. So thanks so much.